Welcome to Focusing on God's Word with Pastor Everton Jeffers. Focusing on God's Word illuminates the Word of God by explaining the Scriptures and conducting word studies using Scripture to support Scripture in the revelation of His Word. Matthew eleven fifteen said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. As he ministered to us today, here now is Pastor Everton Jeffers. Pleasant good day once again. It's a pleasure for me to be back with you today. And we're going to be looking at the third church of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And today we're going to be looking at the compromising church. The church at Pergamos or Pergamon as it is sometimes pronounced. And Revelation chapter 2 reading from verse 12. And it says, And to the angel, the messenger of the church in Pergamos, write, These are the words of him who has and wield the sharp two-edged sword in judgment. Now, this is very important for us to remember because we're going to see the two-edged sword coming up again at the end of the message. And so you need to remember, it says, he who has or wield the two-edged sword. Now, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16, we see John showing us there that he observed Jesus with the sword coming out of his mouth. And that sword was a two-edged sword. Also, in Revelation 1.18, helps us to associate that sword with the mouth of Jesus. But I want you to notice that the sword that came from Jesus' mouth was a two-edged sword. And very early, in speaking to the church at Pergamos, the Bible talks to us and tells us that that sword, that two-edged sword, is a sword of judgment. As we continue the study, you will see why it was important to establish who had the sword coming from his mouth and what the purpose of the sword is, as was established here pretty early. Now, as we started before, we are seeing the same thing continuing out throughout the churches and this is what the Lord told John to write to the church at Pergamos I know where you dwell so he said John write to the church let the church know I know where you dwell now this for some people would seem insignificant but it is very important when Jesus said, I know where you dwell, we need to understand God's, God knows the location of all of his children. When God said to the church at Pergamos, I know where you dwell. He's saying, I know your location. I know where you are. I know the situation you're in. David said, if I make my bed in hell, if I take the wings of the morning, if I make my uh, dwelling place in the heavens, wherever I go, I cannot hide from you. The child of God need to remember this. In your worst of situation, God knows. In your best of situation, God knows. And here, right into Pergamos, he says, I know where you dwell. But what is important is that when God said to Pergamos, I know where you dwell, he went on to say, where Satan sits enthroned. Now, this should be terrifying. But God says, I know where you are and where you sit. I know who dwells there. Now, when he said, where Satan sits enthroned, it is something for all of us to look at. Because... He was not enthroned by God. Satan was not enthroned by God, but by the people. There was so much idol worshiping and pagan worshiping going on in that place that by virtue of the amount of worship 
that these people were given to these idols, Satan was enthroned there because if you are not worshiping God, then you're worshiping Satan. And so the idols that they worship, the paganism that they were into, established Satan in that particular place. Hence, God said, I know where you dwell, the place where Satan sit enthroned. He was enthroned there because he was like the king. He was the most worshiped in that particular place. And that's why the Lord said that I know where you sit and I know Satan is enthroned there. Where Pergamos was established was so wicked so wicked that the Lord himself called it the place where Satan is instated. I reflected back because I wanted to see if there's a similarity to this. And the similarity to this lies back in Genesis when Lot cast his tent close to Sodom. As children of God, we have to be very careful where we pitch our tent because right here Pergamos pitched its tent or synagogue or church right where Satan was enthroned Lot decided to take his down to Sodom and so we are seeing here that even though they were there or they placed themselves there or even it's part of God's being. God knew exactly where they were. If you're not worshiping God, then you must be worshiping Satan. And by worshiping Satan, you make him your king. But this is what he says as he continued the scripture. You are holding fast to my name. This is a great compliment. God is saying, in spite of you made your church or your dwelling place where Satan is enthroned, you are holding fast to my name. Now, how does this benefit the church? Very important for us to note. It does not matter if we came and met the enemy there or if the enemy came and met us there, we must hold fast to the name of Jesus despite the fact that it's a difficult place to dwell. Despite the fact that they live in such a difficult city, the Christian of Pergamon held fast to their faith in Jesus Christ. Those who are truly born again will hold fast to the Lord's name in the most difficult of times. That's the difference between knowing whether a person is truly born or the person is just going through a religious ceremony. The true child of God, no difficult situation, no difficulty, turn him away from his Lord. But as a matter of fact, makes him or her becomes more secure or established. And listen to what Luke chapter 21 and verse 19 says. By your endurance, you gain your lives. This is what happened to the church at Pergamon. They recognize that it is by their endurance that they are going to gain their lives. So those who are truly born again will hold fast to the Lord's name in the most difficult times. And you can say amen to that. And he says, not only did you hold fast to my name, you did not deny my faith. My goodness. You know the amount of people when trials come, when tribulation comes, turn their backs on Jesus Christ. But Jesus was here commending the church at Pergamos or Pergamon, however you want to pronounce it, and saying two things you did that was very commendable. You hold fast to my name and you did not deny my faith. A lot of people can be faithful when all is going well. But faith is only true faith when it is tested. Let me repeat that. When things are going well, everyone can say that they have faith. 
but it is when difficult time comes that truly the person's faith is tested. And right here, the Lord is saying that you, Pergamos, you showed, you demonstrated that your faith is not a fake faith, but a real faith, because in the most difficult of situation, you remain faithful. Your faith was tested and found to be good. Paul, in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three, and I want to show you how important our faith is and how when difficult time comes, God wants us to act. Paul, in his resume, this is what he says. Are they self-proclaimed servant of Christ? I'm speaking as if I'm out of my mind. I am more so, for I exceed them. He was not boasting with far more labors, with far more imprisonment, beaten times without numbers, and often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent the drift on the sea. Now you can imagine that this man went through all of this and remained faithful. This is what God was saying to the church at Pergamos. I know your faith. You did not deny me. You did not deny my name. And so this is the type of faith that the church should have. And the time is coming when truly the church is going to be tested. You're going to hear me say this a number of times, but this is exactly the period of time that is approaching the church now when it's going to be tested. The Lord went on to say, listen, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed or martyred among you, God is saying, in spite of you seeing Antipas being killed for his faith, as a result of his witness of his Lord, Antipas was killed. And that did not deter your faith. But you remain steadfast. And this is what God is saying to the church today. In spite of what is coming, we have to remain steadfast. If it is not already hitting your church, it's on its way. And God commended the church at Pergamos for this particular thing. He said, listen, you saw what happened to him. And you remain faithful even after all that happened. Jesus commended those who remain faithful. And it's still critical in the sense of the only how you're going to gain that crown, that crown of life, is when we remain faithful. He's saying, this is how you're going to gain if you continue to remain faithful even unto the end. But this now, we enter into the beef of the message. Because listen to what he says in verse 14. But I have a few things against you. I have a few things against you. The question here is, which you, who was God actually speaking to when he said, but I have a few things against you. Now, I have to make this point in order for you to get this. In every church, each Sunday or each Saturday, the messenger of that church speak to three sets of people. Those who are truly born again, those who are born again but still carnal and those who were never born at all and you can see this in first corinthians 3 and verse 2 and this is this is why he said right after because you have some among you not all it is important to notice but i have a few things against you because you have some among you now who was the you that God was writing to or told John to write to in this. Now, we have to know who. The you there is in singular, which simply means 
Hence, the Lord was addressing the messenger. He says, because you have, you have people among you. You allow them. God was saying to his messenger, I have this thing against you. You have people in that church who are holding to the corrupt teaching of Balaam. And this is important. You have allowed the people to sit in that church who have these teachings, which we're going to look at in a while. And I want to dig deep into this because every church today have the same thing. We have people in them sitting down with their own doctrine, which are, which are contrary to what the Bible actually teaches. And so he says that you have there people among you who are teaching opposite to what the Bible teaches. Who are holding on to the corrupt teaching of Balaam. Who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. Enticing them to eat things that had been sacrificed to idols. And to commit acts of sexual immorality. Now pastor. Was the pastor to blame? The question is who is in charge of the church? And we're going to see why God address the leader rather than addressing the people first god always follow his order he set a man in charge and that man when things go wrong he addressed that man to address the people so when god spoke to the messenger when he told john to write to the messenger john was writing to the person in charge the pastor or leader to address the save the carnal and the unsaved and this is what he said and the address is mostly to him to those who were doing that which was wrong let's look at what happened here the messenger was aware this is the key thing here there are some of us as pastors that knows what is going on in our churches and to keep people so that sometimes we can get a big salary in some respect we fail to address the sins and the doings that are taking place in the church and God is addressing us today. He's saying to us, but I have a few things against you. Now you might ask, is there any biblical support for this? And I'm going to show you one right now. In 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 13, Eli and his son. Look at why the Lord dealt with Eli. And Eli never had another man in the priesthood. Now I have told him that I'm about to judge his house forever. For the sinful behavior which he knew. Notice why God was judging Eli. Eli was not doing it. But Eli knew was happening because his sons were bringing a curse on themselves, dishonoring and blaspheming God, and he did not rebuke them. I want you to see that. Eli suffered in the process because he knew what his son was doing, and God said, you did not rebuke them. God is saying to his church today, you know some of the things that are happening in you, you know some of the teaching are out of whack, but you fail to address them just to keep members. Listen, it is better, it is better the church dwindle when we preach the truth than to have a big church with mixed teaching that does not apply to the Bible. And so he said, Listen, this is what happened. I have a few things against you and simply because you were not addressing or rebuking those in the church who was teaching things contrary to scripture. Now, let's start looking at when the Bible talks about um, the teaching of Balaam and the following of Balaam. What is it talking about? In 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 15 spoke to what they did. And this is what they did. 
They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now, the first thing that I want you to see here, and this is happening in the church today. A person following the doctrine of Balaam is willing to compromise his belief for the sake of money. Talk to me. Is this happening in the church today? I see people talking about get your bottles and your waters and your cloth and your stuff and send money and then it will be blessed and then send back. That's merchandise in the gospel, my friends. And what we're seeing here, that is exactly what Balaam wanted to do. He wanted to curse the children of Israel for money. This is sometimes being practiced in some churches and God is saying some are still following this particular teaching. Let's look at something else about Balaam. He acts to enable sinful believer and behaviors for personal gain, Numbers 31 and verse 16. To follow the teaching of Balaam is to give advice and entice God's people to be unfaithful to the Lord or even to participate in them, Romans chapter 1 and verse 32. So we see here, it was not just a case that it was happening in the church and he did not know. He knew, but the Bible says that he did not deal with it. And God says that if that continues to happen, I'm going to deal with the leadership of the church if he does nothing about it. It went on into verse 15 and it says, you also have some who in the same way are holding the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now I told you who those are last week, but for those of you who did not listen, let's go over it again. According to the writing of the early church, Nicholas taught a doctrine of compromise, implying that total separation between Christians and the practice of occult paganism was not essential. It is the gospel alone or nothing. You cannot mix other things with the gospel. Now watch the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and that of Balaam. The Nicolaitans dominated the people compared to the teaching of Balaam, which seduced the people. So watch what was happening among the church. One was controlling the people. The other was seducing the people. Now watch God's warning. And this is how I know that when God says you, he was not referring to the entire church, but was more addressing the pastor and those who were saved rather than the entire church. Because he spoke about you and then he spoke about them. Watch what he says. Therefore, repent. That's a strong warning. God says, church, you better repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking, your sinful behavior, seek God's will. Now, let's put this in context. This is an urgent appeal for instant change of attitude, conduct, before it is too late. And this is what Robinson was saying that that actually meant. We have to understand when God says, repent, it's not just a statement. It is actually a word for swift action. He says, or else I will come to you quickly. Notice again. Notice, I will come to you quickly. To who? To those who are in charge. To the leadership. To the person to whom I'm writing. I'm going to come to you quickly. Further evidence, he was addressing the messenger of the church. Now, why is he coming quickly? Why is he coming quickly? He's coming quickly to take corrective measures. If the church does not repent, if the leadership does not turn around, if the leadership does not address the issue, God is coming quickly to take corrective measures. And there are two ways he's going to do it. One against the messenger of the church, and the other he said against them. Now the question is, who is the them? We're going to see this as we continue. The Bible is saying, if the messenger does not repent, 
and apply corrective measures, he, the Lord, will come. Not his second coming. No, 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 no. This coming is not speaking of the Lord's second coming, but this is where the Lord comes to apply discipline. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. For the Lord discipline and correct those he loved, and he punishes every son whom he received and welcomed to his heart. When children would not listen, God steps in and he disciplines us. And the reason why he disciplined us is not to destroy us, but to bring us back on stream as we do our children when we discipline them in love. He said in verse 7, you must submit to correction for the purpose of discipline. God is dealing with you as with son. For what son is there whom his father does not correct? So this messenger of God has been warned to repent or God is going to come quickly with corrective measure to make sure that he repent and those who are living in sin also will repent and he said i will make war and fight against them with the sword now notice for the you he will come with discipline corrective measures for them he will make war and fight against them with the sword of his mouth now that sword of his mouth speaks of judgment notice make war against them god does not declare war against his children no he does not so then who was he declaring war against those doing the teaching of balaam and of the nicolaitans According to Revelation 19 and verse 15, this is what it says. For those of you who don't know, and remember this, I told you this is going to come up again. According to Revelation 19 and 15, it says, From his mouth comes a sharp sword. The sword there is his word, which he may strike down the nation. Verse 21 says, And the rest were killed with the sword, which came forth out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse. The sword is not a physical sword, but the sword is the word of God from his mouth, and it speaks to judgment. Those persons who continue to teach those things, God is going to come and he's going to judge them even before that time when he comes in the final stage to judge the wicked and the dead. And so we see here, Jesus used this sharp two-edged sword to make some separation among the Christians in Pergamos. Now, in verse 17, he made a powerful point, and this is what he says. He who has an ear, let him hear and heed what the Spirit says to the churches. The readers of Revelation are called upon to pay close attention and to seek God's wisdom concerning what is written. Now, when the Bible says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear, all of us basically, only few people were born without ears. But he's addressing people with ears and he's saying, those who have an ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. So what does that mean? It is to hear and to respond to what you have heard. God speaks to the churches through the Holy Spirit. So this requires a different kind of ear that apparently not everyone has. And I'm going to show it to you today. When the children of God hear God, they obey him. You know that that person heard because they obeyed. John 10, 27 said, the sheep that are mine own hear my voice and they listen to me and I know them and they follow me. Simple speaking, when Jesus said those who have an ear to hear, he's talking about those who are willing to hear and willing to listen and then willing to act. When the unsaved hear, he's quickened. What does that mean? When the unsaved truly hear, what God is saying, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 comes straight on stream. And this is what he says. And you had he made alive when you were spiritually dead 
and separated from him because of your transgressions and your sins. When we look at this, what we are actually seeing here, without a shadow of a doubt, is simply this. That the church at Pergamon was allowing false teaching, error in teaching in the church. And God told John, write to them. Today, some of what happened in Pergamon is actually happening in the church today. The teaching of Balaam, where pastors or people who call themselves pastors and apostles are leading God's people astray. Some of them are in ministry, not for the love of the work of God, but for the love of money. Balaam wanted to curse Israel simply because the prince promised him money, but who God bless, no man can curse. And so in closing this morning, I want us to recognize this. What is the sword and how is it going to be used? In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any twigged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it is, it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Jesus used this sharp twigged sword to make separation. He said, I will come quickly to you, the church, but I will declare war on those who are in the church. I am warning those of you who are in the church who know that you are not called. Be careful what you do with God's people because God will always revenge his children. And when God comes, he will judge you with the words from his mouth. The Bible went on and it says, to him who overcomes, the world to believe in that Jesus is the son of God, to him I will give the privilege of eating some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name engraved on the stone, which no one knows except the one who receives it. What does this signify? Why is this important? God is saying, for those of us, in spite of we are in the valley of the shadow of death, we should fear no evil. God is saying, even though we are, our church is established, Satan is enthroned there. He is worshipped. We must make sure that we remain faithful all the way. And that even it means that we're going to lose membership. We have to be faithful on to the end. Because listen to me, God is going to hold those of us who preaches the word of God responsible for what we're supposed to do that we did not do. We have to remember this. Let's look at what it means. He's saying, when the end comes, those of us who hold on, those who maintain our faith in God, we are going to be eating the hidden manna, and he's going to give us a white stone with a new name engraved on the stone, which no one knows except the one who receives it. What does that signify? It signifies a divisive, decisive vote in one's favor, a judgment of innocent, or new innocence, a reprieve from death, a covenant of safe passage, celebratory welcome, honor with free privilege, and a new and lasting identity known only by those of us who receive it. Let me say this. The present suffering can never be compared to the glory that we will receive. I am saying to those of us, those of us who minister the gospel, those of us that are truly born again, know this without a shadow of a doubt. 
that if we remain faithful, that's when we will receive the crown. All that God promised here, we will receive it once we remain faithful. May we remain faithful. May we identify those that are living um, irresponsible life, sinful lives in our church, and with love, reach out to them and let them know. Because God is going to hold us responsible if we do not do it. And also, the punishment or the discipline he will dish out to us in order for us to do corrective measure. We don't have to wait for that when we can do it now. God bless you and have a wonderful day in the Lord. See you next week, the church at Tire Tire. Thank you for listening to Focusing on God's Word with Pastor Everton Jeffers, a Bible-based study revealing the Word of God. You can follow Pastor Jeffers on God's First Radio at 102.9 FM from 1 p.m. each Sunday or on Abundant Life Radio at 103.9 FM. You can also follow him on Facebook or the YouTube channel. Thank you once again for listening to Focusing on God's Word. May God continue to bless you.